get excited for this weekend. <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Glacial Geek Deep Thoughts Thin Coats with me, Phil the Glacial Geek. Uh, today, I am going to be working on uh, something that's going to be very excited, is some more Gene Stealer Cult. Uh, so today I've got a couple uh, more HQs. I've already got a Patriarch, and I've got a Magus, and I've got a Primus already painted and already done. Um, I don't actually have any Familiars done, so I'm glad I'm going to be working on some of those. Uh, but essentially, I'm trying to build out what I have uh, available to me so that with the uh, coming of the Codex this weekend... Uh, I can really start to hit the ground running and really have a lot more uh, versatility in trying to choose how my list works. So I've got a bunch more stuff. I've, I think I've got another maybe 20, 20 um, acolytes available to me that I'm going to have to build and paint. I've got another rock grinder slash Goliath truck that I need to paint, and I've got all the new the new all the new characters coming in. Uh, I painted up um, a. I painted up a what you call it a Keller Keller morph from the the kill team box that came out. He looks really awesome, ton of fun. Uh, but essentially, I'm just I'm just getting really excited about this. I know this weekend I'm actually going to be at LVO and I'm actually going to be playing with my Dark Angels and some Knights. But uh, I mean, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the prospect of playing in the games and doing as well because the list is interesting. We'll see how it goes. Um, I feel. It has the most potential out of a lot of the lists that I've been trying to run with uh, the Dark Angels, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be coming home with the with the with the crown as 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 LVO champion. But we'll we'll see how this goes. Uh, the idea is is uh, that I'm I'm going to be um, I really am going to try my best to try to try to do well. But I'm very excited about the Gene Sealer Cult coming out this weekend, which gets us to our topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is uh, my early. Um, my, my early uh, thoughts on the new Codex and the new direction that they've taken with the Gene Stealer cult uh, going forward. So that's that's what I'm I'm going to be working on, and uh, these are what I'm going to be working on, and that's what I'm going to be kind of talking about because I think it's it's kind of interesting uh, to see what they've done with it and and kind of see where um, where's the paint I was looking for? Oh no, uh, see what uh, they they're working on and, and see kind of. Uh, the direction that I think they're going to go with everything that's happening. So, the big change. The big change with Gene Steeler Cult that's obvious from the get-go of most games that you're going to see played with it is the change to uh, Cult Ambush. So, Cult Ambush um, has changed. It used to be on that, you used to have the table and that units were held in reserve and could arrive on the table by rolling on a table, uh, roll, roll, um, arrive on the game table by rolling on this table and seeing how they arrived. So if you rolled a one, it did really bad, and your opponent got to choose edges that he came in on. Um, you rolled a two, I mean, still not great. You're still rolling, you're still uh, coming in on, you have two table edges that you have to roll off to see where they're coming on. All the different stuff, all the way up to six, where you could move your regular movement and still be able to charge, which is was incredible when you had a huge blob of pure strains or aberrants or something like that that could just get into your opponent's face and really mess up their day but like i said it was entirely left up to chance and i have had horrible experiences where all of a sudden my um all of a sudden the 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 models the i, I had these uh, a, a primus that was coming in with a big squad of dudes and i rolled I spent the command points and i rolled the three dice for him to come in rolled a one one and a two and you're like all right well he gets to re-roll so it's not a problem so you roll it again and you get a 3-2-2, three, two, two, and it's like, well, even though the, you know, the best laid plans of Mice and Men there, you, you, you have this assumption that with the three dice that he's rolling, uh, getting to re-roll, that, that you know, you're going to get something that you could work with. No, instead you end up with you know, more than 12 inches away, which you're not going to get into on the charge. And they just didn't have survivability, and it just was a, a complete and utter mess. And, and oftentimes, uh, the the end of your game. If 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 that if you're rolling for cult ambush on those first turns when they were coming in didn't go well, it could often spell uh, the end of uh, the end of the battle for you because your guys were just they just weren't tough enough to be able to handle an entire round of shooting before they could get in those charges. It just they just they weren't they weren't tough. They weren't they couldn't handle any kind of volume of shooting. 
Uh, I mean, las guns could take down pure strains very easily with the weight of fire that you just start throwing at them. And you're left there going, well, what do I do now? And and, and oftentimes the answer was lose. <laughs> um, and because of that, it became very difficult to really translate that um, into consistent gameplay. And it became very difficult to really come up with uh, consistent gameplay and game plans when you were building lists, when you were building armies, and when you were actually playing the game. Um, the new system that they have where G, uh, D, uh, Colt Ambush has two different options. You have the underground option, which is traditional uh, reserves with deep strike. So they can come onto the board starting turn two, more than nine inches away from any enemy models, um, which is pretty par for the course for a lot of the, you know, for everything else that, that's out there. Um, and they also have a regular Colt Ambush deployment, which is at the start of the, um, at the start of your, uh, of the game, when you're deploying models, what you declare is you declare that your model, uh, your unit has been, is going to be deployed using Colt Ambush. And what you do is you deploy a marker, a blip marker onto the table instead of putting down the unit. So the unit stays in reserves, quasi reserves. They don't count towards the reserve numbers that you have to have your units in, but it keeps them uh, back there at, at, you know, it keeps them off the table at the beginning of the game, but you put down a blip marker. And there's ways to manipulate it. They have characters that can move blip markers. There's a stratagem that allows you to put down more than one blip marker uh, for, for a unit placement. You place them down like that so that at the end of deployment, even if you're alternating back and forth or if you're playing some of the new ones where an entire side deploys before the other, you basically just have a table, uh, a side of the table that just has a whole bunch of blip markers. Um, and they're all over the table there. And if you're playing pure, pure Gene Steeler Colt, and every unit in the army has it. So including tanks, including the Colt Lehman Russes, everything. They have this uh, Colt Ambush rule. Um, so it allows them to deploy with these blip markers. So now your opponent has to try to deploy on the table with having zero idea of what you have on the table. Um, so all they see is a bunch of blip markers, which don't pertain to a particular unit. They just pertain to a pot. They make, basically make it a possible place that your unit can arrive on the table. So now uh, it comes up to the beginning of the game. If you're going first, you then, before you start up, you just deploy all of your units um, within uh, a model has to, the first model that gets placed within an inch of a blip marker and the rest have to be within six inches of them just to keep it in coherency. Um, and then you have, uh, and if you, when you deploy, if you have a unit inside of a, a transport, you declare that at the beginning when you put it down. So you put down one blip marker for the transport with the units inside. So you can't decide like afterwards you go, oh, well, actually I would like these guys deployed inside the transport. You have to make that decision as you're putting down the blip markers, but they're still not on the table. So if you go first, you would outplace them all on the table and then you continue your turn normally. So your opponent had to deploy their army with zero idea of where you're actually placing because if you, you can now completely counter deploy to what they put down on the table. So it really forces your opponent to either be very cagey, which is pretty helpful in, in protecting you, or makes uh, forces your opponent to be um, kind of make make a make a guess and force your hand uh, to respond to either their deployment or to what they want to have happen and it's up to you whether or not you you take the bait at that point so it's it's a bit more risky and it makes it more difficult for uh, for armies that that really depend upon um, either hiding certain units from you or keeping them far away from uh, particular units that you have because everyone when you're going especially when you're doing the alternating deployments, has that one unit that like to hide, they get like to keep towards the end so they can make that counter decision. So, you know, there's no more of an issue of placing down your Lehman Russes and then your, your opponent just puts all of their armor far away so that you can't, you can't shoot them or with, out of sight. You can sit there and you go, okay, well, that's where his armor is. Well, then this blip marker over here that's got great line of sight onto it is where I'm going to put my Lehman Russes so they can shoot. So that's if you go first, you put them down there, you go through your turn, you get to do your thing. If your opponent goes first, they have to go through their movement phase before you actually deploy it. So they've all they've got is the blip markers on there, so possible places for you to deploy, um, and they have to go through their their movement. They have to uh, they have to stay 
more than nine inches away from uh, the from the blip markers, and they can't. So they can't get like you can't have double moving if you're going against tiered ends. You can't have double moving gene stealers jumping up in your grill. The mo the closest they can get to any of your units is going to be nine inches away, uh, which makes it for uh, it really puts a hamper on first turn. Uh, charges against you, which is pretty great. Um, it also puts a hamper on the ability for your opponent to really get into your deployment zone. So if you're playing something like an ITC, it becomes very difficult for them to get the early round, um, early round behind enemy lines or something like that, because they're not going to score it on turn two at the start of their turn because they can't get a unit into your deployment if you put the blip markers appropriately. So it becomes very good at making sure that you can control the board that way. So after they do their movement, then you reveal it. So you can see if he has a force that's like shooting up the uh, up one of your flanks and you need to get something in its way, you just put a whole bunch of chaff there. Suddenly you're placing your neophytes, you're placing your acolytes, you're placing, placing your uh, brood brother infantry units over there. And they're now suddenly uh, going to be able to, to be roadblocks to those units getting over here. And you know that, you know, if you see... A bunch of heavy armor on the on, on the right flank coming up here. You put your you know you put your Goliath trucks on the left flank so that you can no longer you can't just shoot them off the board turn one and leave you uh, moving across the board foot slogging it across. You now can protect units that you need to protect. You can do whatever you need to do to make sure that you have a better option then. So yeah, so you don't deploy your units until after they're at the end of their movement phase. So after they've done their movements, that's when you deploy it. So it becomes very hard for them. To make that kind of um, you know count the, that that kind of counter move to you, and they're left with a situation where you completely countered that first turn movement, and they have to try to respond to whatever you place in front of them. It's fantastic. There's another strategy that allows you to then, when you're placing the units, decide that what I'm going to do is I'm now going to put three of these units that had blip markers on this table. They're actually going to be underground, um, and the only ones that can go underground are infantry and uh, are infantry and bikers. So the characters can go underground, uh, aberrants can go underground, pure strains can go underground, uh, the neophytes can go underground, acolytes can go underground, but your rock grinders can't go underground, Lehman Russes can't go underground, that kind of thing. Um, but they can go under as the blips. So the only, so what that also allows you to do is get past the whole 50% in reserves thing because they're not in reserves. You're paying CP to put them into reserves. The same thing as, as Return to the Shadows that you that we still have access to, where it's you're taking a unit that was on the table and placing them into into a reserve type situation. So it doesn't suffer that same kind of penalty. So you can have your 50% of your army in underground and then place another three units back into underground when it comes to your time. And you have to pay CP for it. I can't remember offhand how many it is. But uh, it's it's an option that we now have available to us, which is Pretty fantastic and, and, and pretty exciting, not going to lie. Um, so, yeah, so they've changed, and it's completely, completely uh, predictable. You know, the fact that the whole process is completely predictable makes it a way more uh, that you can you can actually plan an army, you can plan a list, you can plan a, 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 a strategy around these things as opposed to going, well, if I get a six on this cult ambush roll, hoo -hoo, you watch it. And then roll the one that everybody knows is going to come. Spending CP to roll ones into ones is what I do best. Um, and you're left with a situation. You know, you're no longer left in that kind of uh, situation. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know, uh, sure. Now there's less options for getting off those uh, those charges out of deep strike. Um, but at the same time, you're going to be more able to. Um, there are ways to get a better chance at it. There's a strategy that allows you to um, basically get the number the five result, which was move D six inches or shoot everything that you have. It's now uh, a strategy that you can spend CP for and allow them to do that. Um, there's a lot of the, the there's a couple, uh, I know the Cult of the Four-Armed Emperor allows your units that are affected by the cult uh, abilities uh, they give them plus one inch to their charges when they come out of reserves or when they uh, first round if they're on the table. Uh, so suddenly that nine inch charge is now an eight inch charge, which is, I mean, a lot easier. I've rolled many, many an eight <laughs> trying to get that nine inch charge and fail miserably. Uh, so now you have a better option, uh, better better reliability in trying to get your units where they need to be. Sure, you know, you know, there's no longer a way to get number six. So there's no way to to 
to place them nine inches away and then um, and then move them your whole f first movement phase. So you're no longer going to be able to just tie up their entire back line with that you know with that 30 man blob of, of pure strains. But at the same time, there's no longer a chance of that 30 man blob of pure strains uh, being stuck on your back edge, having to foot slog its way across the entire table um, and just get shot to pieces as it as it gets there. So I think the trade off in my opinion, is a good one. And it's going to take some getting used to, you know. Uh, there's, you're, you're going to, it's going to take a couple games of, of, of figuring out um, the best way to utilize a lot of these stratagems, the best way to, to figure out which, um, which Gene Steeler cult is going to help you achieve what it is that you want to achieve best. So are you looking for um, making that first, is that first charge at a deep strike more important to you? Or do you want them to be able to be more survivable? Are you looking to get shooty? Are you looking for them to have a stronger punch when they do get that charge in? All of these things are things that you're gonna have to ask yourself because you know there's there's ones that give you plus one strength, there's things that give you plus one attack, and it's it's pretty awesome, and it really gives you a whole lot of options now on how you want to run things, how you want to run your army, uh, which is I mean that's that's all you can ask for really from a codex is having these options, having and none of them are ones that are. In my opinion, things you wouldn't want to take. So there's not a single cult option in there that, to me, doesn't have its place, that doesn't have its work. You know, everyone's going to have their favorites. Everyone's going to have the ones that um, really do what they want them to do, um, that want to play, that are going to allow them to play the game the way they like to. Uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways you can run cult, and all of the different cults allow you to run them in those different ways um, in exciting, you know, in exciting excitingly so it helps you in doing whatever it is that you really want to do uh with the gene stealer cult which is uh, in my opinion freaking awesome and that's exactly what i would want from a a codex uh there's a whole bunch of new uh units in there that really help you with all different aspects of the game um we now have ways to regenerate cp they're coming from a character uh as opposed to having to spend your uh, warlord trait on it or your relic on it you now have uh you just take this one character and he rolls to see if you get back cp on yours and your opponent's rolls um and what that does is it allows you to now ha uh it frees you up so that your warlord trait for me for the for instance for dark angels i always took brilliant strategist because to me there was no reason not to i needed to try to get back cp because cp are a huge part of the game these days and what that allowed me to do was extend the, the the usefulness of my cp and extend the usefulness of of the stratagems that were available to me now i just take a character who does the exact same thing and it allows me to 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 stay in the game but keep my warlords to, uh, able to take really cool warlord traits that they have there there's a couple that are uh specific to um the different cults there's a whole bunch of extra ones like there's ways to give you plus one strength and plus one attack to your to your uh to your uh, warlord so you got that patriarch now with seven attacks at strength six or seven it's incredible you pile that on top of it with uh with some of the the psychic powers like we still have might from beyond so suddenly you put that onto that same um that same uh oh, what's his face onto the same patriarch and suddenly he's got um plus one attacks so and now he's got say, eight attacks you know you're looking at eight attacks at strength seven or eight with you know with ap minus three or ap minus six if you roll a six to wound doing d3 or three damage he can wreck a face you know and there's there's char there's other characters that give you plus one strength plus one attack incredible incredible stuff that really works well and there's a whole lot of synergy with a lot of what's happening um with a lot of that's what's happening with all of this so it's a ton of fun and I think it's going to be um, a really good codex. Uh, and in my opinion, the reason it's a good codex is that everything uh, really works together. Everything really works well. Um, and I think everything works together. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything that, that appears to be an outlier. Um, they've, they've finally answered with these new models. You now have two new options that are uh, Gene Stealer Cult specific for fast attacks. So, you know... You don't have to take <laughs> uh, armored sentinels or sentinels anymore. You now have the option to take things that aren't them. 
uh, which is exciting and fun in my opinion. Um, I've got three painted up and built now so that I can run them until I finally get those models built and painted. Um, but at the same time, uh, you have the options now, which is which is huge in my opinion. Uh, having these options, and th and the fact is, there's so many models that are getting released uh, with this with this codex because this is the the real release of the army, in my opinion. I think that they they had the start that they put out all the models that came out in Overkill. Uh, you didn't have access to aberrants on their own. Uh, they did have access to acolytes and neophytes, um, and you had the rock grinder, which is such a cool model. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot that was missing, a lot that you didn't have access to, and this is the first real uh, release of it. So I, you know, I've heard some people be like, "Why are they, you know, why are they giving them so much love?" Because they had to finally flesh out the actual army. You know what I mean? Um, there were so many. There was there was very few other armies out there. Sisters of Battle, maybe, uh, maybe the Adeptus Mechanicus. But even the Adeptus Mechanicus, I think, had more options than um, than the Gene Stealer Cult did. Um, at, at the end of 7th into 8th edition here. Uh, and they just had to finally flesh it out and, and allow us to, to finally have a full army that we can utilize. And they they made awesome, awesome models. I mean, those biker dudes look sweet. And they're so fast. They're so good at what they're really going to do. I think they're going to be great um, harassing units. I think they're going to be great at jumping onto objectives uh, as you play progressive games. I think that they're going to be um, really good at getting into people's faces. There's such versatility with what they've released now that I think there's there's really nothing that we can't do that we can't handle um, they've made it so that our, our our aberrants now with the hammers are gonna be really fantastic at you know running into knights I think they're gonna be really good at being able to handle that and I think that's that's gonna be part of uh, you know yet you, you always have to look at that when you look at a list and you look at it something from a competitive standpoint uh, you know, is it going to be able to handle the um, the different metas that are out there? So you look at this, you look at what's happening right now, and you look there, and you've got you've got orcs that are really throwing hordes into your face. You've got knights that are still a huge part of the competitive scene. You know, guard out there with all of their bodies and and all of their artillery and all of their their different. Um, you know, the different armor that they have, and you see these things and you go, all right, well, can Gene Steeler Colt handle these? And I think the answer is yes. I think that you handle hordes with um, a horde of your own so that you're throwing bodies on bodies. I think that acolytes are a better um, are better than boys now. Honestly, they're seven points each, so they're about the same points, they're about the same points cost as a boy, uh, but they are innately have rending claws. So they've got an AP to their close combat. Um, and they've got the ability to be buffed up with a whole bunch of different powers so that you can easily have strength 5, strength 6 acolytes hitting in there doing AP minus 1 minimum and on wounds of 6 they're doing AP minus 4 and throw in some of the heavy the special the heavy weapons that you've got there so like the, the heavy rock saw, the heavy rock cutter, the heavy rock drill and suddenly you've got like very versatile and very hard hitting close combat units which is I mean, which is more to say, the more than what the orcs can do. And you can take them in squads of up to 20. So you can have your own, you know, you can have 20 acolytes against 30 boys. It's going to be a whole lot of dice you guys are rolling. <laughs> but, you know, they, they can hold their own, I think, against the hordes. And then against knights, um, you know, that we don't have quite the, the, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, shooting options. You've got Lehman Russes, which are, uh, I mean, they, you ask any guard player, they, they, can, they can take down a knight on a lucky day. Uh, but they also have the ability then to um, to get aberrants inside there, and if you can get an aberrant charge in there, so you give them spend the CP to get them that first round charge. You got a ten man squad with hammers that are running in there. You give the Primus up in there, so suddenly you have uh, you've got twenty attacks with the hammers hitting on um, hitting on uh, threes because you give them plus one to hit with the with the Primus. Uh, there's ways to buff up their strengths, so suddenly you're hitting on you know, minimum strength 10, uh, and you can, I think you can probably, I think you can buff it up so that they get up to, uh, to, to strength 16, so you're wounding on twos. Uh, if not, you're still wounding on threes, and I think at that point, you're just, you're beating into knights. You're doing three damage flat, AP minus three, unless they've got the, uh, unless they've got the, 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 um, what is it, the relic that allows them to have, uh, a, have a, an invul save in close combat, um, you're you're going to be
be killing some knights. You know, you can get 20 attacks in there, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, doing three damage apiece. You're either killing them or you're putting them at such a low number that they're going to be far less effective. And the beauty of it is that you're going to be, you know, cult ambushing in with them. So, you know, you're going to be deep striking in with them, basically. And at that point, you're, um, you're deep striking in with them and you're uh, uh, making it harder for him to try, making it harder for your opponent to hide their vulnerable knights. So they might give that, that relic that gives them a, an invul save in close combat to one of their knights. So now you deep strike in and hit the other knight that's behind it, you know? And uh, they, it becomes harder for them to hide uh, their, their important units, especially when you've got the cult ambush going on over there. So, you know, they charge at you with their gallant and instead of running into, um, you know, into the big ju juicy stuff that they wanted to, they just run into a bunch of neophytes and, and get, you know, messed up with that. Sure, you know, they could fall back out of combat. You're not going to be able to lock them in. But at the same time, uh, you can really make their uh, game plan uh, really get messed up with just using what the cult now has. You're not even having to pull too many shenanigans to make it happen either. So... It's super exciting, um, and, the, and the possibilities are just all over the place. It's really awesome. They also fleshed out our uh, psychic powers, which is great. Uh, they gave a lot of our psychers the access to two psychic powers now, which is, which is phenomenal because it gives them more versatility. They're still casting one power, but at the same time, they have the, the ability to get up there and go, all right, I'm going to give him... Um, uh, you know, uh, might from beyond because I really need this this heart this unit to be hard hitting and just wail into my opponents and it's just going to be you know they're wounding their Lehman Ru this this squad of aberrants with 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 hammers is going to be wounding Lehman Russes on on twos perfect that's what I needed you know that's what I needed this turn but then after that first turn happens and your opponent responds and that 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 aberrant squad gets whittled down a bit. You look around and you go, all right, well, now I need some more direct uh, direct uh, attack into here. So I'm going to cast um, Mental Onslaught onto them, which is a super awesome power. You cast it. It's uh, I think it's a War Charge 6. And what happens is you now dice off uh, with adding your leadership and your opponent's leadership to those dice. Um, and who, if you have a higher result than your opponent, then they take a Mortal Wound. If they took a Mortal Wound you dice off again. If, again, yours is higher, they take a mortal wound. And this continues until either the model is dead or you fail to cause a mortal wound. So suddenly now you have your Leadership 10 Patriarch casting this power down there against uh, against vehicles which have Leadership 8, Leadership 7, you know, something like that. And it becomes very difficult for them to, to, to outlast you at that point because you've got a three up, basically, on your dice roll to what your opponent has. And there's ways to buff leadership. There's ways to reduce leadership. There's ways to get your, I think, your patriarch leadership up to a leadership 13 easily. So, one second. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um... But yeah, so now all of a sudden there's ways to get your 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 patriarch's leadership up to like I think up to close to 13, and now your opponent can get debuffed as well. And at that point you've got, you know, where they just can't they can't pass, you know. Or even if you roll a one, they're needing a six to get the <laughs> to get it out there. And it's 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 pretty incredible. It's pretty awesome the the, the ability and the and the and the strength and the versatility they had. So. You don't have to give it all or nothing unto that one guy that that's his only power that he has. He now has the ability to be pick and choose. So it's like turn one, I really need to buff my dudes to get him in there. Uh, turn two, I'm going to try to do some direct damage. Turn three, I got my other Acolyte squad up in there. If I can give them plus one strength, that's really going to, plus one attack, they can really clear out the, my opponent's uh, screens over there. So I'm going to buff them up again. And it, and it, and it gives you the ability to, to really uh, work with, with what you need. And um, sure, it'd be nice if they had the ability to cast two powers, but that's what these little guys are for. They allow you to cast another power, so now you can be like, all right, well, I'm going to try to like really really hurt that knight, put on a whole bunch of mortal wounds, doesn't kill it, so I'm also going to buff that that, uh, that aberrant squad that's about to charge into them and to finish them off, and I mean, it's going to be awesome. I really think it's going to be awesome. Um, they did do a few things, and this is also something that I think is very interesting from this codex, is it shows a different direction that I think 
that GW is probably going to be working towards. Um, I don't think they ever want to get rid of soup entirely. For no other reason than it's super fluffy. You know, it's super narrative that any any of the novels that you read, they no one ever works on their own. Or very rarely works on their own. Uh, you know, there's times when Space Marines go off and do their own thing. But oftentimes in the big battles that they face there, you've got guardsmen that are then supplemented by the Astartes and have a knight that comes in and, and also helps out. That's that's super fluffy. That's like the, the basics for any of these giant campaigns that you have going out there. And you can see it in any number of books that you have out there. Sure, they all can work on their own, but they very often work together because that's what they do. You know, And the number of times that you've had Chaos Space Marines being supplemented with, with, with demons that arrive... I mean that's just what happens. That that's the that, that's the the basic of basis of, of anything that that is really occurring with all of these guys. And I think that it becomes that, so that's why they're not going to get rid of it. I don't think they want to get rid of it for that reason because it really hampers their ability to to drive the narrative and allow people to play the game as they want to and play with their toys. And that's what it comes down to. That's why you started out with open play where it's like, well, you know, I don't have all of I don't have enough to really to, to really do one of these, you know, to do one of these um, detachments. So you just play with your toys, play with whatever you want. Parallel lets you do it. So I don't see them getting rid of, of the soup anytime soon because of that. But what they've done is they've made it on a match play uh, system here, and they've made it a bit more, uh, they've given incentives basically to play mono faction, mono book. Um, for instance, you can take an Astra Militarum detachment with for every Gene Stealer cult detachment that you have. That's very fluffy. The Gene Stealer, the, the Gene Stealer cults are notorious for infiltrating into the the PDF and the the local uh, Astra Militarum regiments that are on planets and and insinuating themselves. And then the Day of Ascension comes and they turn and they they start fighting for the you know the four armed Emperor. But um, that's all part of that's part of what they do. So it becomes very fluffy that they're allowed to work with the Gene Stealer cult in that way. But what they've done is any kind of Gene Stealer, any time you take a Brood Brother uh, detachment, so Astra Militarum changes the regiment to Brood Brothers, you only receive half as many CP rounded up. So if you take a battalion, you would only receive three CP versus five CP uh, normally. You also only get um, you also so you know if you take that brigade, you're only getting six CP as opposed to uh, as opposed to the the twelve CP that you would normally get for a brigade, uh, and that makes it far more enticing to just want to take another Gene Stealer cult uh, detachment because you have access to Lehman Russes, uh, you have access to um, you get access to cheap troop choices with seven points for an acolyte. It's five points for a neophyte and four points for a brood brother, which are now separated. So it's basically to represent uh, the the like the the abilities that the different uh, units have. And brood brothers now don't get um, benefits from the cult uh, abilities from the cult abilities. So that leaves you now where you have um, you know so you can't have uh, the the four point brood brothers receiving the benefit of being Twisted Helix or anything like that. Uh, so it makes it very interesting that they've they've really framed it where it's like, you can do it, but there's benefits for staying in Mono Faction. Um, I don't think they did the same thing with the Tyranids, but uh, at the same time, you know, you still have access to stuff. One thing that did seem interesting, because I think they looked at how much... Uh, and I think a lot of these rules were made both for fluff reasons and possibly for uh, balancing reasons, um, but... The, Gene Stealer units don't receive the benefit of the cult abilities. So um, your, your pure strains are not going to have the, the plus one to charge on the first turn if you're a four-armed emperor, for instance. Um, I think part of this was balance because previously a lot, especially in the, the competitive scene, a lot of what you saw were people just taking cult ambushing, giant blobs of cult ambushing pure strains, and they didn't want this to become, you know, uh, you know, Codex Pure Strain. I think they wanted this to wanted you to be able to see and use all of the different stuff that they have. Um, and from a fluff standard, it's that they the Pure Strains are never indoctrinated into the cult. They just they're doing their thing and they're kind of bringing along the rest of the cult with them to do their bidding. You know, patriarchs, for instance, uh, don't have 
the unquestioning loyalty because unquestioning loyalty now is the ability for a unit to take wounds from this someone. So the patriarch isn't taking wounds from his, you know, from the little dubro next to him. He, he, no matter how much he begs, he doesn't care. He's chaff. He's just a thing that gets used in the in in the grinded up in the cogs to get towards uh, the day of ascension. Um, so, and the same thing with pure strains. They they don't. There's no brotherly love between. Uh, between them and you know that's just the what it is you know they're they're something completely separate they're very they alien they're just straight up aliens they're xenos they get to be used within this and the cult thinks that there's something more to them but the reality is is they aren't so that's what you have uh, I think that's really kind of interesting the way they've they've they've, they've framed that um, they've also limited uh, each of the characters um, gene stealer cult characters can only be utilized uh, once in, in in any one particular detachment. So you can't have three killer morphs as your eight, as your elite units, as your elite choices, for instance, in a uh, in a in a brigade. Um, you could have three different detachments, each one with a killer morph. Uh, you could have three different detachments, each one led by a patriarch. Uh, but you can't have three patriarchs, for instance, in one detachment. You can't have three killer morphs. You can't have three. Um, locus in in a in a in a in a detachment anymore, which is I think interesting because it's it's a way because I think a lot of the characters are going to be very good, and you're going to see a lot of these different characters uh, being utilized on the table, and this is a good way to keep them from being spammed, so that you don't just have a whole bunch of patriarchs, just you know you don't take like you don't see someone taking two command detachments of 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 patriarchs going running up the table just like wrecking face. Um, I think that they they've they've made it so that you can just take one per detachment. You know, you can still take three, so up to you know the the rule of three, but it has to be in three different detachments, which is cool. I think that's good because that means that you're going to be taking a lot more, um, you know, a lot more versatility and, and diversity of, of units, which I think is going to be good. So you know, I'm still painting up extra guys because I you know if I want to have two different detachments each led by a patriarch, sounds good. If I want to have two different you know. Primus is up there giving buffs to different units. Great. If I want to have two mag guy uh, just doing different things on either side of the table, perfect. And I've got a lot more versatility and a lot more redundancy with that. But they have to come from different detachments. So if I want to run, you know, two battalions, they can each be in there. Um, so, yeah. So I think it's super interesting, super cool what they've been doing. I really love the new models that are coming out. I think they look awesome. Uh, I love the fact that they've got a lot of different options. I like the fact that you now have a new option for Amagus because a lot of times, you know, they they come out with one model to represent the whole line. And I think that, I mean, that's the reality of it is that you, if you're going to have one model to represent it, you can. And, and, it, and it does it in most cases. But in this case, they now have two different options that you can run, which is great. If you Especially if you want to make a, an army with two ma uh, Maguses. You can now have two different looking mages, and it becomes a lot easier to recognize them as opposed to having to rely on color or scheme. You can have two very different looking models, which is fun and cool, uh, and it just gives you a bit more diversity of, of models on the table, which is always looks cool. Always looks cool. The, you know, when you have a whole bunch of the same thing, it's like the monopose issue that you have, where it's like, all right, you know, I've got a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of the marines that are holding their gun to their chest that they used to have, and it's like they all look the same, and it's like you got rank and file of them even when they're in the trenches looking exactly the same and it's like it can get a little boring looking so they have when you when you get the the ability to change up their poses and change up what's happening it becomes more dynamic and more interesting on the table especially from a hobby perspective and having more options with that is is great and i think that's awesome and it would be cool if they do that more so going forward in the future maybe and i guess they, they have done it with a uh, like how many different options do you have for uh, Primaris Lieutenants? <laughs> I think there's like a thousand at this point. You can have an entire chapter's worth of Primaris Lieutenants at this point. <laughs> uh, all being different uh, models. Uh, and I just think that, that having that kind of ability to have different models is perfect and awesome. So it'll be fun to see that. Um, but yeah, I, I just... I'm. I mean, I'm just super excited is what it is. I'm super excited to see it. Uh, I've gotten to play... I played them... Um, once so far with with the the bit of information that i've been able to get out and it was awesome it was a lot of fun and the dice didn't necessarily go exactly as i had hoped they would uh but at the same time i don't think i was ever out of the game so you can see how it goes um that's literally not a spoiler 
It's just that it's a very good game. <laughs> so check it out. Um, that's actually going to be coming out, I think, Monday. So check it out. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, but I really am excited by it. I'm, I'm my wallet's not excited by it, <laughs> and my and my uh, and my backlog isn't excited by it. But I'm excited by it. I think you guys are going to be excited by it, and it's just going to be a lot of fun. The versatility we have. There's really cool different nuances that we have. Like we, there's there's a stratagem called brood uh, brood. Uh, uh, brood Coven, um, which basically has, if your Patriarch is, is your Warlord, which he has to be, if you have a Patriarch in your list, it has to be your Warlord, because he doesn't answer to anybody else. So he has to be your Warlord. You can spend CP, and you can give um, a Warlord trait up to one uh, Magus and up to one Primus in your in your list, and give them Warlord traits. Uh, they don't become Warlords, and they don't count as Warlord for like Slay the Warlord or anything like that, but they get the Warlord trait. So you can throw them in there, and suddenly now you've got three different people benefiting from three different Warlord traits, all being able to help, you know, push things along. Like there's a Warlord trait that increases the aura abilities by three inches, which is really great on a Primus, because suddenly you now Deep Strike him in nine inches, and if he doesn't make that charge, he's still within nine inches of that unit that did make the charge to give him the plus one to hit, which is awesome. Um, you've got the plus one strength and uh, strength and attacks, which is really great on a patriarch. Uh, and there's uh, a couple other different utility ones that you can just use on your on your magus. Uh, for instance, cult of the four armed emperor. Their specific their their um, cult specific warlord trait is a free reroll during the game. To for theirs is more uh, specific. I think it's it's for a saving throw uh, to hit or to wound roll. Um, I believe are the three things. There may be one or one more, maybe, but I think those are the three that they've got um, that you can use that free reroll for during the game, much like Brilliant Strategist or anything like that. Uh, but in addition, you get D3 additional CP. So I think even if you just give him that, you make up the one CP that it took to give everyone else to 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 spend the stratagem to give him this to the Warlord trait, and you have the ability to get an additional two plus or an additional two beyond that, which is awesome in my opinion um but yeah i'm just super excited i think they're going to be great i think they're going to be a very competitive army which i'm very excited about because um i love my 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 dark angels i really do and i love playing with them um and i'm going to continue playing with them in battle reports and friendly games left and right uh but competitively uh i i they were always at a disadvantage that's just the reality of what it is compared to a lot of other armies so what I had to do is I had to respond and I'm coming off the back foot in a competitive scene and I end up in situations like I was at Siege of Augusta where I went one in, uh, where I had one win and four losses over the course of the weekend. That's rough. <laughs> you know, I don't think that with the Gene Steeler cult that I'm likely to, to see that kind of result, if I'm being honest. Um, I think that they're going to be uh, one of the top armies out there. Uh, I think that allying in some Astra Militarum, like... Uh, like maybe basilisks or something like that is going to be super beneficial because uh, we still are very lacking in long range, high strength shooting. Um, so if you can find ways to get that in with Astra Militarum, I think they'll be very good competitively. I think that allying in allying in some um, some Tyranids because they've they're on a bit of a rise. I think they got some benefits from. Um, from chapter approved that really make them a bit more competitive. So allying them in will also make it a bit more competitive, which will be fun and interesting. Um, but even just from a pure pure Gene Sealer cult uh, list, which is what I think I'm going to be going towards myself, I think they're going to be super effective. I think they're going to be strong. I think they've got the versatility and they've got answers to everything out there uh, as long as you play them well. And that's what it always comes down to is, is the you know, at the end of the day, the better general is going to win, but this is going to give me the tools to be the better general I can be. That's what my opinion is on it. So I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I think it's going to be um, just super cool and super uh, super awesome to be able to play them out on the table. So um, let me know what you guys think. I know that there's a bunch of videos out there. I didn't. I don't have access to all of the codex right now. I've had bits and bobs that I've been able to pick up and, and glean from um, enough to play out a game with what I had, but not enough to really find any like hidden gems yet. So give me a chance to look through the codex before I find something that other people have missed. Um, but I think that uh, it'll be fun to be able to get out there and, and see how they perform out on the table. 
Um, but uh, once I get in my hands, I'm, I'm super excited to see what you know to really get them out on the open road and see what they can do. And getting my hand on the new uh, the new characters is going to be a lot of fun too. I think when all push comes to shove, at the end of the day, these characters that they have now are going to become super crucial in figuring out what you can do because we're going to have a whole bunch of bodies that can absorb damage, uh, just like absorb shots that are still going to be able to give a punch of their own, but they're going to be able to distract and create screens to allow our characters to get in and do exactly what they want. Like we've got D3, we've got, you know, sniper rifles that are almost on par with, uh, that are, are close to on par with Vindicare Assassins. We've got, um, you know, we've got characters that are going into, to, uh, going into close combat and just becoming beasts. Uh, there's there's uh, an ability to take a sword that gives you plus four attacks as a as a relic, which is pretty freaking amazing. Um, but it's it's you know it, it, there's a lot of versatility, a lot of different things that we can do uh, that we previously hadn't been able to do. Uh, that now we you know having access to a full codex always makes an army ten times better. And the changes that they made to to, to cult ambush. While there are going to be times that I wish I could have gotten that six roll and gotten that my unit up into their face, overall, I think my army is going to perform more consistently and perform better when I can plan for it. So if I know that I want this unit to get there, I know that I'm going to be spending the, the command points to give them the extra D6 charge in there. I know that I need this character that's going to drop in with them to give them the extra bonus to charge. I know that I'm gonna want this this character in there with them so that it can get the plus one to hit or plus one to wound or reroll wound rolls, whatever it is, I can now plan it out as opposed to being like, let's see what my gene sealer is gonna do today. All right, they're coming off my table edge because that's how I rolled, it was awful. It's happened before and everyone's been there, but now we have the ability to be a bit more predictable and more predictable allows you to be a better general because you're not just relying on the luck of the dice. You're relying on your skill, your planning, and your ability to respond to what happens uh, effectively. Because if your opponent, like I, we had, I've had times where my opponent got super aggressive on me turn one with the old Gene Stealer cult, and my only response would have been for my Gene Stealers to come in and you know counter charge them over there, but suddenly I roll horribly and they're out of the way and they're, char they're trying to trudge their way across the table and just getting plinked by las guns. And it's like, what are you going to do? Now I'm not going to have to worry about that. So, uh, again, let me know what you guys have thought from what you've seen, what you're most excited about, uh, what you want to see happen, and, and kind of where you see these guys falling into uh, the realm of, of, of codexes, either you know narratively if you want to, competitively if you want to, however you want, lore-wise, however you want it, let me know what you think. Um, and, and to keep discussion going down below. So, uh, I hope you guys have all enjoyed this. I certainly have. I have been Phil the Glacial Geek as always. And until next time, have fun.